Genesis chapter 18. Turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter 18. Guys, I have been loving the book of Genesis. Been loving studying with you guys each week, and I'm excited for this portion. Let's pray. God, we just know that as a church, we're, we're doing a lot of things. We're asking your saints and those who attend here to think and pray. And Lord, even for myself and the staff and everyone that comes to this church would know exactly what they need to do to participate. Because as always, Lord, we know the body of Christ is going to function the best when every member is exercising their gift. And I pray that you would show them, even right now as I'm talking through the Bible study in the middle of the night, what they need to do to participate. Uh, Because we know this is your church, Lord. It always has been. And so we look to you, we love you, and it's in Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. Genesis chapter 18, we've uh, transitioned from the 17th chapter to now from Abram, who now is called Abraham, and his wife Sarai, who is now Sarah. And it's such an interesting contrast from last week to where we are today, because Sarah, the 89-year-old, is promised within a year In the 17th chapter, she's going to give birth to a son named Isaac, and we're going to find that out in the 21st chapter of Genesis, that not only is that true, but through this family is going to come an exciting, great nation, so that by her 90th birthday, she's going to have a kid. Which, by the way, unique as it is, I Google search the oldest women today who have had children, and the majority of them are in India. And one of the oldest that I found was a gal in her mid-70s. And it was unique. It was, I, I, I was like halfway through the article, and I was like, I'm getting distracted. We need to study the Bible. So um, this is unique. This is miraculous. This anatomically doesn't happen often, but God made what was impossible possible. And that's where we're at in the Genesis 18. A lot to cover. Let's read verses 1 and 2 of Genesis chapter 18, make our way through. It says, Then the Lord appeared to him, by the terebinth trees of Mamre, as he was sitting in the tent door in the heat of the day. He lifted his eyes and he looked, and behold, three men were standing by. And when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them, and he bowed himself to the ground. First thing I want you to notice before we talk about Abram bowing himself, burying his face into the ground, is the verse that declares, then the Lord appeared. That term, the Lord, it's a term most of you might be familiar with. It's known as Yahweh. It's the covenant name that God is going to introduce himself when he appears before Moses in Exodus chapter 3, that the Lord, Yahweh, makes himself known. And as, as important as it is that we're introduced and we see God now identified as Yahweh, what's important is the way he appears to Abraham here in the text. There's three people represented. One of them, and this is in my strong opinion, that the, the, one of the three there is none other than a presentation of Jesus in human form before his incarnation. We're going to talk about that here in a second. Uh, speculations are two, the others were angels. They were some form of spiritual beings. But I do believe Jesus, there's a the, theophany here, and Jesus is present before Abraham. And again, we can assume it's Jesus pre-incarnation because in pre-virgin birth because the scriptures declare, and you guys can look at the screen on this, John 1.18 we're told no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten son who is in the bosom of the father, he has declared him. No one's seen God ever. Timothy talks about this too. First Timothy chapter six, verse 16. No man has ever seen God in the person of the father. Now think about this with me. Follow me for a moment. It makes sense that the appearance here in Genesis chapter 18 is Jesus before his incarnation in Bethlehem that you can read all about in the New Testament, in the gospel accounts. But what's fascinating to me, because it made me wonder, Jesus appearing before Abraham here, did he look the exact same as he did in the previous chapters, as he will also in the gospels recorded? Like, is this because we know that he's going to come, the virgin birth coming through Mary, but it made me wonder, like, has 
Jesus always looked the same at this point because Abraham is going to identify. He's going to figure out that this is him because the first thing he does in this prominent culture is he bows his face into the ground. Another thing to notice is where they are. It says they were in Mamre near the terebinth trees. The reason why this place is also significant, especially in the, in the life of Moses, is because Mamre is where uh, Abraham moved when he came back from the promised land, when he was actually in Egypt. And you can read about that in Genesis 13. That's where he built the altar unto the Lord. You guys remember that? Uh, Mamre is also important because Genesis 14 tells us he stayed some time there. But we're also going to learn in the chapters ahead that he's going to purchase a field in Mamre, and he's going to bury his wife, Sarah, there in Genesis chapter 23. But then Isaac's, or excuse me, um, Abraham's son Isaac and Ishmael are going to then bury Abraham in that same area in Genesis 25, 9. And interestingly enough, Isaac, but not Ishmael, is going to be buried in Mamre important place in the life of Abraham. And so he sees these guests. He runs from the tent to meet them. He bows himself to the ground, to which some of us might think, great. But both culturally and understanding Abraham and, and his importance, at least within that community of people and that culture, to see such an incredibly influential man understand whom his audience he, do, he doesn't care what the culture, what the community views him as. He, just, he knows he's before, he's before the Lord. And he can't help but, but to bow his face. He worships. And as I was thinking about, and I want to tell you guys something as I was thinking about this. I know, I know you guys know this, but worship is this one-on-one -on -one intimate experience with the Most High. We, yes, we were doing instrumental worship before our Bible study, and we're continuing with this attitude of worship as we're reading God's word, but worship itself is such an interesting concept. It's something we all know. We're all good at worshiping something, but pertaining to worshiping God, and especially what I'm seeing here in the text, it made me realize, guys, worship ought to be engaging. Worship should be more than just standing there, and, and you know what? God knows the heart. God knows where we're at. But I need you to know, especially in this place, it's, I'm not like, he's going to say, we can start bringing tambourines to church. It's going to get crazy up here. The flag people are going to be in the front soon. Not, I'm not saying that. But what I am saying that pertaining to worship, guys, it should be engaging. It should be something where we're realizing who we're before. Uh, and not only that, it's something that's natural, that should be expected. In fact, I'm going to read to you a quote by Skip Heitzig. By the way, someone told me that I should say this more often. Skip Heitzig is one of our board of directors here at the church, but Skip, who's a pastor in uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico, he, look at this quote on the screen. He says, when we truly worship God, there's going to be humility. Humility in worship comes from two things. Number one, recognizing who God is, but number two, recognizing who we are in the presence of God. Once you get those two things straight, the inevitable result will be humility guaranteed. To which I ask you the question, church, those hearing my voice right now, how do you react when you are engaged in worship to the most high? Because I'm going to tell you something. Your reaction is going to determine your adoration coming before God and realizing, not just realizing that, you're bef that we're worshiping the King of Kings, we're singing about his holiness and his goodness and his righteous and righteousness and his, and his undeniable mercy. You can't help. And I was, even in the back as we're worshiping, I was, I was so overwhelmed, guys, by the goodness and presence of the Lord as a church that we're worshiping. And I read about it here in, in Genesis chapter 18, and you see Abraham, he recognizes who he's before, and he bows down and he worships. And look at verses three through five now. Let's continue in the text. And he said, my Lord, Adonai, is the Hebrew word here, my Lord, if I have now found favor in your sight, do not pass by your servant. Verse four, please let a little water be brought. Wash your feet. 
and rest yourselves under the tree. Verse 5, and I will bring a morsel of bread that you may refresh your hearts. And after that, you may pass by in as much as you have come to your servant. And I can just imagine he's looking at them like, what are you going to say? So they said, do as you have said. Whether he expected that answer or not, that response or not, I want you to notice Abraham's reaction to them allowing him to go get food and serve them. Verses 6 through 8 of Genesis chapter 18. So Abraham, he hurried into the tent to Sarah and he said, quickly, make ready three measures of fine meal. Knead it and make cakes. Verse 7, and Abram ran to the herd, took a tender and good calf, gave it to a young man and he hastened to prepare it. Verse 8, so he took butter and milk and the calf, which he had prepared. He set it before them, the three people represented, we have Christ and whoever the other two are, and he stood by them under the tree as they ate. I mean, is anyone else imagining what we're just reading right here? This has to be an amazing sight. Guys, a 99-year-old <laughs> is hurrying to the tent. He's running to the herd. Have you ever seen a 99-year-old do that? And I just I can imagine it. <laughs> I'm going to make it. <laughs> I can imagine Abraham's neighbors like, slow down, Abe. It's too fast, buddy. You're going to hurt yourself. I mean, I just, I'm, I'm imagining him just, he's so excited. He doesn't care. He's going to, he's running there. He's making his way. Whether you like it or not, it's written in the Bible. Abraham at 99 years old ran. Google that. You'll have fun with it. But I also want you to imagine the picture that Abraham, this 99-year-old prominent man within this community of people, within this culture, in the heat of the day. Guys, he has, the Bible, remember, we learned in the previous chapters, he has over 318 servants. And at any point, Abraham could have said something like, to one of any of those servants, and had said something like, you know what? I need you guys to take care of everything while I entertain the guests. But I want you to notice in the text, he doesn't just order. He participates in serving. This is so important to, guys, this is just as important, especially within leaders of the church. You call yourself a leader, you call yourself one who serves the Lord, then it does not always necessarily mean just delegating, but participating. And I can't help but to think of Pastor Chuck Smith before he passed away. And people always telling stories of how in the middle of church, in between services, he was, you know, he's unclogging the toilets. The pastor of the church, it's like, Chuck, have someone else do that. Oh, no, you know, I got to take care of it. I mean, he, was, he had a servant's heart. And I, and I love that example. I love that that sets the tone, especially with Abraham here. He's personally serving. And if there's a lesson you can learn from that, ladies and gentlemen, if you identify as, with Jesus, you call yourself a Christian, you serve the Most High, it means you need to serve Jesus in some capacity. It means something should be involved with you serving him. Guys, when we, the, the Bible talks about the church, not the building we're in, but you, that we, we are the body of Christ. And it is my strong opinion that when each member within the body is exercising their gift within the body of Christ is when the church benefits the most. That as a church, we are going to flourish, not just because of the teaching or the worship, but when each person in our church, guys, participates in some capacity, in the facility and outside of the facility, exercising your gifts. Because whether you think it or not, you have something to offer, guys. You have something to offer that's going to benefit, edify, encourage the saints within the church at Calvary South Denver, and even the saints outside of this facility that fellowship somewhere else. I wholeheartedly believe that. For you to think about And so, church, here's the challenge. The direct invitation. If you're not serving, pray about where you should serve. Think about it. Whether it's in the children's ministry, guys, we need kids' ministry helpers. Usher greeter team, coffee, cafe shop. We have announcements. You guys are always hearing us say things. Start thinking and praying about it. Start praying and thinking about whether or not you should participate in our CSD group, join a group, host a group, have a community group within our church so other believers can go to your house and learn the Bible together. Meals ministry, youth ministry, wherever it is. 
Pray about it, guys. Because when the church exercises their gifts collectively, our church is going to continue to flourish. It's going to, it's going to benefit so much. And like Abraham, we can't forget the important truth, especially here. If you're serving people, you're first serving the Lord. Oh, you guys, people lose perspective of that. You want to know why people get burned out so easily? Because they lose perspective of that. They forget, I'm serving the Lord right now. And you know what I've discovered when it comes to serving people by serving the Lord? I realize when I serve people within the church, it can be incredibly difficult. You want to know why it's difficult? Because Jesus equates us to sheep. And you know what sheep are known to do? They bite you. Some of them leave marks. I have battle scar, ministry battle scars over the years of people. And it hurts. It hurts, guys. But it doesn't change the fact that we're all imperfect. Oh, guys, I'm, my wife will tell you how imperfect I am. She knows my ins and outs. But that's my point, is that perspective helps us see this victorious end result even though I'm serving God's people, what I really am doing, first and foremost, is I'm serving Jesus. And a part of that, by serving Jesus, you notice people can be difficult. And again, I want to recommend to anyone and everyone that's hearing my voice right now, you ready for this? Read the book by Warren Wearsby called On Being a Servant of God. Pure gold in every way. In fact, I'm going to read to you some quotes directly from that book that Mr. Warren Wearsby gives, uh, just two of them because they're pure gold in light of our topic of what, I'm, what we're discussing right now. Look at the screen. When people we serve irritate us, that never happens, or disappoint us, we should pray for ourselves and ask God to increase our love. God often allows problem people to come into our life so that you'll learn to depend more on his power and not your own resources. Look at the last one, next quote, by Warren Wearsby in the same book. God did not call us to be manufacturers. He called us to be distributors. True servants of God help others whether they themselves get anything out of it or not. It's so true. Guys, it's so true. So rewarding. So rewarding to serve with you guys. And maybe that's not heard enough from the pulpit. I'm going to just say it in front of you guys right now. I am thankful that I get to serve with you. I'm thankful if you do serve in any capacity here in this church. Thank you guys because it is a privilege to be able to come alongside you guys and co-labor with one another. So please don't ever lose sight of even that. I don't want the pulpit to just to be, serve here or else. Thank you for serving here. And if you're not serving here, think about where you could. Abraham here in the text, he has this joyous servant's heart. He simply serves the Lord Jesus by actually serving him food here in the text. Another cool concept is it says that the, he gave him three measures of fine meal, cakes. He took a tender and good calf. He took butter and milk and the calf. He prepared it. He set it before them. In the next part of this text, it says, he stood by them under the tree as they ate. And you're thinking like, what is so important about that? His servant's heart allowed him to have community. He was able to not just serve them, but have community with them. And that's the same thing for us, guys. When we serve one another, we get to participate in fellowship with one another. It's not just how I can pour into you. Guys, I love not just coming to the church and being a pastor here and teaching on Wednesdays. Guys, I, get, I, I find true joy fellowshipping with you guys. I love it. And I, and I hope you don't ever lose sight of that too. We get to participate in serving, corresponding also, we get to serve one another, serve in fellowship. Look at verses 9 through 10. Then they said in the text, then they said, where is Sarah, your wife? So he said, here in the tent. And then he said, I, this is Jesus, I will certainly return to you according to the time of life. Behold, Sarah, your wife shall have a son. First thing I want you to notice, and it has only been a couple months at this point, because when the promise is declared to Abraham and Sarah, they're 89 and 99. And by the time they have Isaac, they're going to be 90 and 100 years old. So at this point, she is now identified no longer as Sarai, but Sarah. And it's only been a couple months since our study in Genesis chapter 17. Chronologically, obviously, we met last week. Uh, but they ask where she was. He announces, and he's probably smiling. He's probably so excited. He's like, she's in the tent. I'm so happy you're here. And more than likely, uh, the, the, 
her name being mentioned causes Sarah to start eavesdropping. And I know she's eavesdropping. I think she heard Jesus in this, this portion say, uh, and when the time of life comes, behold, Sarah, your wife shall have a son. I think she heard that. I think her ears perked up. She heard that. And this is amazing news. This is exciting. Nothing can take away this moment until we read Sarah's reaction. Look at verses 10 and 11, 10 through 11. We're told Sarah was listening in the tent, the tent door, which was behind him. Oh, I knew she was eavesdropping. Verse 11. Now Abraham and Sarah were old well advanced and aged, and Sarah had passed the age of childbearing. Therefore, Sarah laughed within herself, saying, after I have grown old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord, being old also? She's laughing at the news. Laughing. Laughter. What an interesting human reaction. Time Magazine just released their newest thing, their newest uh, magazine, and the title is The Science of Laughter. But did you actually know laughing is biblical? Oh, it is. Not just because we're reading it in our text here, but it's actually mentioned all throughout the scriptures. And I'm just for the sake of time, just going to read two of them to you. Proverbs 17:22 on the screen. A cheerful heart, I love this, a cheerful heart is good medicine, but a broken spirit saps a person's strength. Womp, womp, womp. It's true. It is true. Laughter is biblical. Psalm 126, too. Look at the screen. We were filled with laughter and we sang for joy. I've always said that it's a Jurassic curse to make people laugh. Growing up with my dad and watching him behave the way that he did, I make it sound like he's this monster, this out of control person. No, he just likes to make people laugh and it rubs onto you. Uh, when you're around people that make you laugh, it's, it is. It's medicine for the soul. It's a good, it's a biblical thing. We were filled with laughter. And most of you maybe have heard someone say, did you know that laughing is good for you? I didn't know if I believed that or not. So I did the most uh, important thing when it comes to researching. I Googled it. Yes. I wrote, uh, is laughing good for you? To which one study showed this. It's not on the screen. I'm just going to read it to you. Laughter is good for your health. Laughter relaxes the whole body. It's a good hearty laugh, relieves physical tension and stress, leaving your muscles relaxed up to 45 minutes after. Laughter also, look at this, boosts the immune system. Take that, doTERRA oils. And the same thread of questions that people were asking as, is laughter good for you? Someone actually la asked this, because have you ever done that where you Google something and it shows all the lists below? Someone asked under that, can you die from laughing? <laughs> it had an answer. I'm just going to read it. Yes, it's possible to literally die from laughter, not from the joke itself, but from the body's reaction to it. Among the many possible medical ways that laughing too hard can kill you, ruptured brain aneurysm, cardiac arrest, collapsed lung, strangled, uh, strangulated hernia, gelastic seizures, and stroke. Now, this has nothing to do with the study in Genesis chapter 18, but I'm going to read to you the rest of the questions that were underneath it. Is it good to laugh a lot? Is it unhealthy to laugh too much? Is laughing a good workout? Can you be tickled to death? Last one, can you die of boredom? Someone actually Googled, can you die of boredom? And Child Protective Services have confirmed that a child, in fact, cannot die of boredom. I have to tell you this quick story. When, when I was uh, probably Jaden's age, or Madison's age, my, my daughter's six or seven, I remember I came into my dad's office at, at our house. I was like, Dad, I'm so bored, you know, the whole body movement and everything. Why is Gino Geraci? You know what he said to me to relieve my boredom? He told young John Geraci, six, seven-year-old, go read the dictionary. Did you just tell me to read the dictionary as a six-year-old? Yeah, you're bored. That's what I used to do. Of course, that's what you used to do, Dad. <laughs> Can you die of boredom. No, you can't. Back to laughter. So although laughing is biblical, apparently healthy, and evidently, according to a Google search, that never lies, you can die from laughing. Sarah's laugh here in Genesis chapter 18 was not a laughter of, of optimism. It was cynicism. It was that of disbelief. And it was of disbelief because what she heard. 
Abraham and Sarah were old, well advanced in age. Sarah passed the age of childbearing. It was noted enough to add that into the scriptures. And she laughed because it seemed impossible on paper. It seemed anatomically impossible for her 89-year-old prune body. She just looks at it and she's laughing. She's laughing at it. She's like, that's, that's, that's impossible, but literally that's impossible. So look how Jesus reacts to the laughter. Verses 13 through 14. And the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh saying, shall I surely bear a child since I'm old? Verse 14. Is anything too hard for the Lord? And at the appointed time, I will return to you according to the time of life. And Sarah will have a son. The Lord was right to ask the question, why did Sarah laugh? Why did she laugh? Again, laughter is such an interesting thing. There's three different laughters that came to my mind of what it does to people. There's probably more, but again, for the sake of time. Laughter does one of three things to people. Laughter can make you uncomfortable. Another person's laugh. Like the maniacal laugh. The like, why is that person laughing by themselves in the corner over there? There can be an uncomfortable laugh. Then there's an infectious laugh. These are the laughs when people laugh. You, you start laughing. You're just like... That's amazing. When we were in Bible college, John Corson came to visit the, the, the Bible college and he was teaching. And if you've ever heard John Corson, just Google John Corson laughing. But he would tell the corniest jokes and he would laugh at his own joke. And no one would laugh at his joke. They would laugh at his laugh because he'd be like, <laughs> you guys are laughing because it's just like, that's so infectious. Laughter can do that. Third and finally, what laughter can do, it can actually make you angry. These are generally the laughs by people that mock you, make fun of you, or do some kind of, you know, like I said, mockery of some kind. This is the category of where Sarah is. She's laughing because she can't believe it. This is a joke. And so the Lord, because he's the Lord, asks, shall I surely, shall, shall I surely bear a child? Since, or she asks, excuse me, Shall I surely bear a child since I'm old? Is, and, then he, and then the Lord says, Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. But remember, the question is directed to Abraham. Poor guy. Poor guy. I mean, re, Sarah is the one who's being rebuked by the Lord, and like Abraham is taking the heat there. It's like, why did your wife laugh at the proclamation and promise I just made? And Abraham's like, women, am I right? <laughs> he doesn't know how to answer that. It's like, I'll go find out. I don't know. And look how Sarah responds, because we're not told Abraham's reaction. As she realizes, she's caught. Verse 15 in Genesis chapter 18. I love this wording, guys. But Sarah denied it. Say, I didn't, I didn't laugh, because she was afraid. And he said, no, but you did laugh. <laughs> and, guy, and, and I'm laughing at this because I'm thinking, I'm like having a conversation with my kids. Literally had this same conversation this morning when I woke up before I studied for this text. Peyton, my youngest daughter, is running through our house, screaming, laughing, stomping through everything. And everyone is still sleeping in the house. So when I woke up to confront this little curly-haired, wired girl, I said, Peyton, why were you screaming and waking everyone up? And she said, it wasn't me. I wasn't loud. As if I'm going to look at her and be like, my mistake, I'm sorry, sweetie. No, I'm looking at her. It's just simple. No, but you did. You literally ran through the house and woke everyone up. And, and she's looking at me like, but I didn't. No, but you did. This is the conversations I have with a three-year-old. And yet this is exactly what's happening here in the text. It's just so funny to me. It's like, Sarah, you can't hide anything from the Lord. It's the Lord. Why did you laugh? I didn't laugh, but you did. Again, it's just a hilarious, the honest wording. No, but you did. She's busted. And she didn't laugh like Abraham did. Remember last week when Abraham is introduced by God in this proclamation after 13 years of not hearing from the Lord, the Bible says he laughed. But it was a laughter of excitement. It was like the laughter of the dad from... Uh, from the Lady and the Tramp. Remember that Disney movie? Like, boy, oh boy, it's a boy. Like he was excited, he couldn't believe it. But Sarah's laugh was that of disbelief. <laughs> like that's ever gonna happen. But I want you guys, as you know, we're laughing, we're looking at this because it's so honest, it's so brutally honest. I wanna ask you the same question God asks Abraham. And what he asks Sarah to 
really ask this for your own life. Really ask this. Is there really anything that's too hard for the Lord? Is there anything that is just impossible for God to accomplish? And the answer, of course, is never. The prophet Jeremiah will even declare this. He'll tell us, Lord, you made everything, the heaven, the earth, everything. There's nothing that is too hard for you. And as we're going through the book of Genesis, the God who owns cattle on a thousand hills, who has unlimited resources, who knows the future, the past, he knows what we're going to pray before we even pray it, takes what is literally anatomically impossible on paper and makes it possible. There's nothing that is too hard for the Lord. Nothing. And sometimes we know that, but for most of you, and sometimes you need to hear it again, that there is nothing too hard for Jesus. An appropriate question to ask them. Look at verses 16 through 19. So then the men arose from there. They looked towards Sodom. Abraham went with them to send them on the way. And then the Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham what I am doing? Since Abraham shall surely become a great leader and a mighty nation and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed by him. Verse 19, I have known him in order that he may command his children and his household after him, that they may keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice, that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. The text tells us Abraham went with them to send them on their way. So apparently customary at this time, it was common for if you're, if you're the hospitable host, you're going to like halfway or a certain portion of the way journey with those who are coming to visit you. Uh, and that's exactly what he's doing there. And the Lord poses the question, shall I hide from Abraham what I'm doing? Well, what, what is God doing exactly? Because think about it. We just learned that God is going to bring through Abraham a great and mighty nation. And in God's mind, he's thinking like, this is the guy that's going to bless the whole world. And I need you guys to understand, especially as you're hearing my voice, that statement is true. The culture and the nation of the Jews are going to come through him. But more importantly, Jesus is going to come through the line of Abraham. And even though on paper that's like, yeah, that's great. I, I need you to understand how important and how great that is. Because through this man's seed and this great nation that's going to come, Jesus specifically, the one who is our redeemer, our hope, church, everything we're doing tonight is centered on the gospel of what Jesus did, of when he died, and when he's going to rise again, validating who he is. It is imperative that Abraham, and he's going to understand this, especially as he's going through this, because ultimately, yes, the seed of, of Abraham is going to come. Christ, he's going to be born. He's going to offer salvation. And he has to be a great leader which is why the Lord says he's going to command his children and his household after him. He was determined. God was determined to reveal to Abraham what would soon happen to Sodom and Gomorrah. Look at verse 20 and 22, 20 through 22. The Lord said, because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great and because their sin is very grave, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry against it that has come to me, and if not, I will know. Verse 22, then the men turned away from there. They went towards Sodom, but Abraham still stood before the Lord. So the perversity of these cities were so grave. They were so bad, guys. They were so monumental that the moment of truth is coming. And God says there has been an outcry against Sodom, to which the question should be, who's the one doing the outcry? Maybe it's Abraham. It could be. But more importantly, which family member of Abraham is living there right now? It's Lot, his nephew. It very well could have been him. What's also interesting, did you guys know that the New Testament refers to Lot as righteous? The epistle of Peter talks about it. It won't be on the screen, but it talks about in righteous Lot, his soul was vexed day in and day out by what he heard and what he saw. Lot's called righteous. That doesn't mean he, he was as righteous as Abraham was. I mean, he believed God's promises. He was walking with God. But the comparison of Sodom to Gomorrah in comparison to that standard, well, he certainly was more righteous, that is Abraham, than the normal standard. But he is. He's considered righteous. Lot is considered righteous in the epistle of Peter. 
So even though the cities have turned sour, I want you to notice, again, the text says, but Abraham still stood before the Lord. He didn't abandon ship. He didn't abandon hope. He knew the outcome. Continue to verses 23 through 26. We're going to fly through this. And Abraham came near and he said, would you also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Meaning, you know, don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. Suppose there were 50 righteous within the city, verse 24. Would you also destroy the place and not spare it for the 50 righteous that were in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing as this, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous should be as the wicked. Far be from it. You shall not you shall not the judge of all the earth do right. Verse 26, so the Lord said, if I find in Sodom 50 righteous within the city, then I'll spare all the place for their sakes. So now here's Abraham at this point. He's reminding God of his characteristics, his, his attributes, his principles, if you will, of, well, hang on, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Because in Abraham's mind, he's thinking like, well, God, as a righteous judge, you're not going to punish the righteous with association with those who are wicked within the city. You're not going to take the innocent and the guilty and put them all together. And now what we're really going to see is the uh, sales side of uh, Abraham here in the text as he's, in a way, he's bargaining with, with, with the Lord. Last verses, verses 27 through 33. Then Abraham answered and he said, because he's realizing like the Lord is answering him. He's like, you know what, let's see how much further we can go with this. Then Abraham answered and he said, indeed now, I who am but dust and ashes have taken it upon myself to speak to the Lord. Suppose there were five less than the 50 righteous. Why not just say 45? Uh, would you destroy all the city for the lack of five? And then so he said, well, if I find there 45, I will not destroy it. Verse 29, and he spoke to him again. And he said, well, su suppose there were 40 found there. So then he said, will I not do it for the sake of... So he said, I will not do it for the sake of 40. Then he said, well, let not the Lord be angry and I will speak. <laughs> Don't be annoyed, Lord, at what I'm about to ask again. Suppose 30 should be found there. So he said, I will not do it if I find 30 there. And then he said, indeed, now I have taken upon myself to speak to the Lord. Suppose 20 should be found there. So he said, I will not destroy it for the sake of the 20. Verse 32, then he said, let not the Lord be angry. And I will speak but once, but once more. Suppose 10 should be found there. And he said, I will not destroy for the sake of 10. So the Lord went his way as soon as he had finished speaking with Abraham, and Abraham returned to his place. Why did he stop at 10? Why did he not start at 10? Really is what it comes down to. Who do you think he's thinking of? He's probably thinking about Lot. He's probably thinking about Lot's wife. He's probably thinking about Lot's wife and their children, and potentially their children's children, that comes to a grand number of 10. The slew of kids that come from Lot, and there's Abraham. There's Abraham thinking on their behalf. And this is what I want to end with as we're thinking and we're coming down. You know what I love about Abraham, especially in this passage of Scripture, in this portion? He becomes an, in, an intercessor. Abraham is the person who would pray on behalf of the people. He was the guy that knew they were from a distance and agonized and said, I'm going to pray on their behalf. And maybe some of you are called to this thing called inter intercessory prayer. And I think at Christians, every single one are called to some point to intercede for others. I also need you to know, church, that, and I don't mind putting her on the spot, Carolyn, my wife, often prays for you and people in our church. She fasts for you guys. Do you know that? Carolyn hears about things and she will on her, she said, you know what? I'm praying for such and such because they've been heavy on my heart. She, inter, she takes it upon herself to be an intercessor, to pray for those that are in the church and even outside of the church. And Abraham, he reminds me of all the ladies, guys, that pray for my salvation. Let me explain context. I'm a pastor's kid. I grew up in this church but I didn't get saved until I was 16. And I remember it had to have been right when Carolyn and I church planted six years ago. And I, I, we were just visiting the church and I was teaching. 
And this gal came up to me afterwards and she said, praise the Lord that you were teaching today. And I was like, well, thank you for the kind words. And she's like, no, you don't understand. Your mom was miserable when you were a kid. I'm like, what do you mean? She's like, every week for Bible study, she would come crying because how horrible you were. And I'm like, that's actually true. And then she's like, and praise the Lord because every single week we prayed for your salvation. And I, I'm so happy I heard that for two reasons. Number one, it's a reminder to you guys to pray for the Jonathan Dracys of this world because even though you might see those little punks running around and just being their punk-like self, it's the little punks that God calls into the ministry. And not only that, but, and I mean this, I, I hope you know I, I mean this, I, I, I am nothing apart from the Lord. And the fact that I identify with Christ and I'm a Christian now is nothing more than a miracle because I know that he paid the price on my behalf, for my behalf. And I am so thankful for all those ladies in my mom's Bible study that prayed for me that I would come to know the Lord. And maybe that's for some of you. It's like, ah, I can think of a couple that there's no hope. <laughs> but is there anything too hard for the Lord? He takes what is impossible on paper and makes it possible. His unlimited resources are beyond what we could ever imagine. Why do you think the Bible says he's who's able to give exceedingly abundantly above what we could or ask or think? We have not because we ask not. He calls us to serve one another as a, as a church because ultimately, guys, we serve the Lord. We serve one another because we're called to. We have the example to. And if you call CSD your church, find out where you can serve. And there's always good fellowship that comes along with it. There's always good fellowship. Chapter 18, complete. Let's pray. God, we thank you again for the example of Abraham. We thank you for the hope and promise that Jesus Christ, the only name under heaven, by which we can be saved is going to come through the line of Abraham. That Jesus is going to be introduced into the world miraculously. He's going to be born in a barn. And yet he is still the king of kings. And he did not come to be served, but to be a servant to all. And I pray that not only would we be that example but that we as a church would intentionally make intercessory prayer on behalf of one another. That we would right now, as I'm talking, as we're praying and as we're closing our eyes, asking you, where do you want me to serve? Where do you have me, Lord? And that we as a staff and as a church and as a leadership could not only fill the seats in the sanctuary, but that we could be eternally minded and think about those who could be filling heaven. Give us a heart to give the gospel to every person we come into contact with. We love you. We praise you. And it's in Jesus' perfect and holy name. Amen. Let's worship, guys.